So I wanted to do a, a brief introduction to our speaker this morning. I'm Pastor Nathaniel. It goes by Pastor Nathan or Nate. Um, you have a flexible name. Um, he uh, is coming to us from Orange County area. Um, he pastors a church over there in Laguna, Laguna SDA, I believe it's called. And um, he took time out his weekend um, to be able to come down here and bless us for um, our Faith Hope Love weekend. Um, Faith Hope Love kind of serves as a revival for our campus and for the surrounding community. Um, and uh, I think he's done exactly that. God has used him to help revive us this weekend. So Pastor Nathan, we're looking forward to uh, hearing you today. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Man, it's been so good to be here with you guys. One person was happy. All right. It's been so good to be with you guys. Man, I just want to do some shout outs really quickly and just say thank you. I did a little bit of it last night, but I just want to thank uh, the Faith Hope Love Project. I want to thank you, Troy. I know he's not here. He called me, he invited me, and he said, by the way, I'm not going to be here. And he told me that after I got here. But it's really good to be able to be here. Pastor Zach's been super awesome by getting me over here and showing me around the campus, the activities you guys have here. This is a super nice campus. I don't know if you guys have seen other campuses. This is huge, and it's actually usable. I don't mean to throw shade on Andrews, but it's a long, big campus, but it snows nine out of the 12 months, so you can't even use it. You guys have a beautiful campus. The church is right here. The dorms are awesome. The cat food is actually good. The cat food is good. If you don't think it's good, you, don't, you haven't been other places. The cat food is actually pretty good. I really enjoyed it. Um, we've been doing... <laughs> we've been doing a discussion about the gospel and a certain aspect of the gospel. We've been emphasizing the wholeness of the gospel. I think the temptation for a lot of young people... Um, especially myself growing up, the biggest thing that, that, that we forget is that the spiritual realm, the gospel, which we preach about, which we believe in, is not just a mental exercise. It's not just something we practice and believe, and then we live our lives. No, the, the gospel, the spiritual realm, is actually the truest parts of the life we live here on earth. It's the real thing. It has literally physical, tangible effects in our life. It changes us. What we do, what we think, how we breathe affects our bodies. It changes everything. And so the title of my sermon today is called Aftermath. And I want to read this definition of aftermath because this word aftermath means the consequences or effects of a significant, unpleasant event. You know, I want to talk today uh, about a different perspective of the great controversy today, because I think that's very important as believers of what we understand about God, as we understand the word, as we understand this world that we live in. There's a great controver controversy around us, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's not an argument between your mom and your dad, or you and your teacher, you and your friends. There is a battle. There's a spiritual battle going on right now, and it is very unpleasant. There is unpleasant and horrible consequences in this world that we have to live with, that we have to deal with, and we're part of this big drama that has unfolded in this world. And so today, I want to share a quick story about myself and then move into some biblical principles and scriptures. There's going to be a lot of scriptures today, so I'm going to throw a lot at you. Some of you guys have been introduced to some of these concepts. Some of you have not. And so bear with me as we go through this, because today we're going to be getting into the Word. Is that okay? Is that okay? All right. Very good. Um, Let's start with the story. Growing up, I didn't grow up in the nicest of areas. I grew up in San Fernando Valley of California, LA County. And the area of San Fernando Valley has various types of economic statuses. Some areas towards the more of the closer to the beach are more well-to-do, nicer communities, nicer schools, nicer malls. The streets are better. The police answer a lot more quickly. And then on the other side, it's not so well, and that's where I grew up. So much so that um, my mom wanted to stay home with us growing up when we were little. My older brother, and I was about a year older than me, 
And when I was born, my mom had to go to work some of the hours during the week so we could help pay for the bills of this small, dinky apartment, which was not really expensive to begin with. And so we asked one of our neighbors to babysit us, and there was these two gentlemen, and they were twins. They were twins. Well, one day we didn't find out what happened to them. They, they, they didn't show up. And in fact, we turned on the TV, and we found out what happened to them. You see, we didn't know that they were both involved in, in the gang. And we found out on the TV that they were chased into a gas station and gunned down in the bathroom. Both of them. Blood all over the bathroom, everywhere. And we found this out on the news. My mom was horrified, and so we got our things, and we moved to another place. And in this apartment building, uh, there's, it's kind of like a condo, but it's not. It's an apartment. And so we're upstairs, my mom's downstairs in the kitchen, and she's like, I know this area is not safe, but I'm not taking a chance because these are my boys. So my dad's at work, he has three or four jobs, Burger King, McDonald's, Taco Bell, he's working like a bunch of food places just to make ends meet so my mom can stay home and watch us. So my mom's downstairs, we're upstairs jumping on the bed, and for some ironic, weird reason, I'm jumping on the bed, the window's open, and I jump through the screen, down two stories, onto the concrete, my mom flips because she hears my older brother screaming. All the neighbors are around. Someone put a blanket over me. My mom didn't want to see what was going on. And I was airlifted to one of the hospitals. Ironically, one of my distant uncles, who doesn't have our last name, knew what was going on, and he was a surgeon, and so he was in the room because he wanted to make sure whatever happened to me would help me to live, <laughs> because no one knew what was going on at this point. And when they put me in, I got in the hospital, I'm in the room, it wasn't even a couple hours later that they called. My mom, they called our family, and they say, we don't understand what's going on. And my mom's in tears and crying and saying, what happened, what happened? We're like, he doesn't even have a bruise. We don't know what's going on. Are you sure he fell from the window? Because there's nothing wrong with him. You know, and I, was, I grew up hearing these things. I grew up hearing, man, all these things happen to you, and there's many more that even CPS came to my parents. I'll say, you know, we're hearing all these things. What are you doing to your kids? I've drowned in pools multiple times. For some reason, my mom left me with my brother, and she went somewhere, and multiple times she's coming. I'm at the bottom of the pool. I'm just looking up, and she dives in, and I've gone to the hospital for that. Like, these sorts of things kept happening in my life, and then my mom kept on telling this to me as I was growing up. Hey, for some reason, for some reason, you're still here. I'm like, yeah, it's a coincidence. It's luck. It's, it's not a big deal. You know, I, I'm not believing in all this stuff. You guys tell me this every time. I go to church. Go here. Go here. That's cool. I'm here. You know, you guys probably just made these things up. I want to see some documentation. I was just very just unbelieving in a lot of these things that were happening growing up. And I got a huge wake-up call. And this was something that I caused, that I did. I was a senior in high school. And I was at my uncle's house. We just finished watching a Laker game, and they won, and I was going crazy. I was super excited. And I just got my license. My older brother and my cousin, they had this big, heavy metal, really expensive Jeep. And they were just saying, hey, let's race to, to Grandma and Grandpa's house in Simi Valley, about a 45-minute drive. Let's, let's go ahead and race. And my uncle's there, and he overhears, and he goes, hey, guys, it's not a good idea. It's pouring rain out there. Not a good idea. And we're like, okay, Theo, don't worry. We're not going to go too fast. It'll, it'll be fine. So I get in my parents' car that they let me drive. And then my brother and my cousin get in the Jeep, and they take off, and we start racing. So we're on the freeway in the pouring rain. I have my window wipers going crazy. I barely could see the road in front of me, and we're weaving in and out of traffic, just in and out. And my brother and my cousin start picking up on me. And I'm like, man, I got to catch up. So I swerve into the carpool lane, and I just gun it. I go into one of the underpasses, and as soon as I hit the underpass, there's like a little bump. The car hits that bump. Hydroplane slams into the center divider. The car flips, and it rolls down the freeway. 
And the only thing I could remember is completely having the car on its side, skidding down, the window shattered on the impact, the glass sh uh, went all over the place, some got in my face, some, some got embedded into my head, and my, the music's blazing, going super loud, and I'm just holding on to the tire. I don't have, or hold on to the steering wheel. I don't have a chance to think about anything. I don't have a chance to throw up a prayer. I'm just in shock. I'm holding tight to the steering wheel, and I'm just looking at the ground as my car is going down the freeway. All of a sudden, I just close my eyes. I don't say a prayer. I don't say anything. I'm like, I, I don't know what to think. I'm just like, close my eyes. I'm just holding on. And the next thing I know, I open my eyes. My car is right side up, stopped. No cars hit me. Cars are way, way behind. My music is blaring, going crazy. Window wipers are going, and I'm sitting there just hearing the rain, the hard rain pour on my car. And I'm freaking out. And the first thing that comes to my mind is, get out of the car, the car's going to blow up because I've watched a lot of movies. So I'm like, I got to get out of the car. So I jump out of the car, I run a couple feet ahead, and this random guy, who I believe was an angel, random guy came out of his car, didn't even, look, didn't even stop to talk. He just ran, put flares all around my car, many car lengths back, and he just started putting flares all the way around, all the way around, all the way around, then jumped back in his car and took off. And I had the awkward conversation of calling my dad on the phone, on the freeway, saying, hey, dad, I need you to come and pick me up. I just destroyed your car. I flipped it. I think it's going to blow up. Can you come here and pick me up because I'm freaking out? And my, dar my dad starts laughing. He's like, yeah, sure. I'm like, dad, I'm serious. And then he could hear my voice. And I'm one of those guys back then. Now I cry all the time. But then it's like crying is like a huge sign of weakness. And so I actually started to choke up. And my dad's like, oh, this is serious. So my dad comes, the police officer comes, he looks at my car, he analyzes it, he tells him, he's like, I don't know how this car is right side up. There are burn marks on the top. This car should have flipped. It should have spun. You probably should have hit other cars. Looking at the burn marks, looking at what happened, you shouldn't be here. It was then that my mom sat, sat me down. She's like, you know, Nathaniel, I need to tell you something. She said, you need to get your life together. You need to get your life right with God because there's too many things happening in your life and you're still here. And the main thing I want to share with you today is my mom shared with me this, this thing that really, really started me searching the scriptures. And I've talked with some other pastors about it and they give me a little bit more and there's a lot more that I'm, that, that's not being shared today, but it's going to be enough for you guys to understand the spiritual battle that we encounter. My mom told me, you know, Nathaniel, our family has been cursed. Our family has been spiritually cursed. And she started sharing with me the things that previous generations have done. We've kidnapped, we've stole property, people have stolen people's wives, people have done some crazy things. And she said, you know, I've seen this in scripture, I've seen this in other families. And I'm sitting there thinking, here we go again. God does this, God does that. Okay, mom. Thank you very much. She's like, Nathaniel, just pray about it. Because you shouldn't be here. And for some reason, God has protected you. Aftermath. Consequences of a significant and pleasant event. The devil fights dirty. The devil doesn't care about you. In the world that we live in, many people just believe that it's us and that's it. Other people may believe it's us and sometimes obeying God, sometimes not listening to God, sometimes acknowledging him. And then there's others, what the Bible really talks about. There's us, there's God, and there's a devil. There's a real devil out there and he's out for each and every one of us. There's a devil out there, and it's clear in Scripture. And there's a great controversy going around us that if we would but open our eyes and see what God is trying to do in our lives, we would be horrified by what the devil has done and what he keeps on trying to do. But before we go into the Word and see some stories and see some Scriptures, 
I want to have a quick word of prayer with you. Let us pray. Dear God, if we only knew the depth and the power that you have and the way you hold yourself back to give us the freedom to choose to love you as much as you love us. God, if we under, understood the depth of the power that the enemy also has, but you have restricted. And God, in the midst of all of these things, this life that we live, the busyness, the craziness, the decisions, God, I pray now that you would open our eyes to the word of God, to open our perspective to the real things that matter in this world today, right now, this moment, in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter five, Matthew chapter five, I'm gonna use this story as a, as a springboard for our conversation. Matthew chapter five, or Mark chapter five, I'm sorry. Mark chapter five, I'm gonna go quickly because there's a lot of text I wanna share with you today. It says, they came to the other side of the sea, Mark chapter five, verse one, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when they stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tomb with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tomb and no one could restrain him anymore, even with chains, for he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains were wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mounts, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Do not torment me. There is a belief in this world that when things go bad, it's God's fault. Whether you're a believer, whether you're an atheist, there is an ingrown thing in you, in me, to say, this is not my fault, it's someone else's, and it must be God's. You see this story of the location of the Gerasenes, it's near the Decapolis, and in this region, most of these people were Gentiles. They were unbelievers, and it was not a very well-to-do area. These were probably a lot of poor people. These were fishermen, and these people did not know anything about God, but when they heard about this Jesus and that he had power, a lot of them were curious about him. And this man, be filled with the spirit, with a devil in him, came over to Jesus and said, you're the reason. Do not torment me. You're the cause. You're the reason. This is the world we live in. I want to share with you some passages of scripture that help us understand the, the, the battle that we're in, the world that, 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 that we live in, because it's very important to understand what the scriptures tells us about what we are responsible for in this life, in this spiritual life that we live. The first text I want to share with you is one that's very common and it's very basic. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, and it says this. The first thing is that in Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle, our battle, is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. There is no middle ground when it comes to the spiritual realm. You're with God or you're not. That's it. There's no middle ground. In the spiritual realm, there's no middle ground. You either intentionally make the decision or you accidentally make it. And that goes into our second principle that goes into this. We reap what we sow. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says this, Do not be deceived. From the beginning, don't be deceived. Galatians 6 verse 7 says this, God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Notice what it says about us as a church. Oh, this gets good now. 
Notice what it says about the church. Matthew chapter 18, you know that whole thing about when you got beef with someone, go and talk to them. And if it's not going well, grab your friend or grab an elder, grab someone, take them, and then take the rest. And then if not, treat them like a tax collector. And that's a whole other sermon. People think we got to estrange ourselves from them. No, it actually means to love them even more. But notice what it says right after that, how we treat each other, how we act amongst people in the church. The verse right after that, it says this, truly I tell you, when Jesus says that, he means pay attention. You guys know that, right? When Jesus is saying truly, he's like, hey, this is, this is something you need to pay attention to. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You inherit the spiritual blessings of God. You are in his protection. Did you know that when you get baptized, you align yourself with God? You put yourself under his reign, under his protection, under his covenant. Is this making sense? Have you guys heard that God made a covenant with us? When God died on the cross, he made a covenant, an open covenant that you, if you choose to believe in him, you will have eternal life. You put yourself under the protection of the most high God. But with that decision, guess what there also is? If you sow to the spirit, you sow to the spirit and get eternal life. But if you sow to the flesh, you sow to what? Corruption. And it goes deeper. This is one that I've spoken extensively with some pastor friends and research and some scholars. And this, 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 this one still, still kind of shocks me, and this is important. There is no causeless curse. There is no causeless curse. Curses just don't happen. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 7 says this, Just as a bird has reason to flee and a swallow to fly, so a curse does not come without a reason. If there's a bird that all of a sudden flies, there's a reason. If it's on a bench or it's on somewhere, there might be something coming or it's flying to get food. The bird just doesn't stand there and fly. The swallow doesn't fly. It's giving an example. Look, when these things happen, there's a cause. There's a cause. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 3, Balak, the king of Moab, he gets Balaam. He says, I need you to curse Israel. Curse them. And he tried and he couldn't. And you know why? Because they were under the rights and the protection of the Most High God. They couldn't be cursed. They couldn't have the devil's power on them. Notice what it says here in Deuteronomy 23 verse 5. Guys, I'm quoting scripture. It's all here. You can look it up. Deuteronomy 23, 5, it says this, Yet the Lord your God refused to heed Balaam's curse. The Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing. Because the Lord your God loved you. When you make alliance with God, when curses come, they don't touch. Isn't that powerful? God hears this curse. He's like, "Uh uh-uh, those those are mine. You can't curse them. But you know what I am going to do? I'm going to bless them instead. Notice the words of Jesus. We sometimes skip over some of these words and these passages, and they're all there for a reason. Matthew, 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 says this, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. That's not when they say a curse word at you. Come on, guys. That's not what that means. They're cursing you. They're cursing you. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Jesus is going deep. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. James 1.13 is very clear. God doesn't tempt you. You're tempted by your own desires. You're tempted by your own things. God doesn't torment people. This is not a God thing. This is a devil thing. But God allows it. And God respects our decisions to choose him or not. These are our our legal spiritual rights. If you want to look at it that way, these are our legal spiritual rights. We make an allegiance to God. Notice what it says in Matthew 25, verse 41. At the end of time, he says this, Then he who will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed. God, God didn't curse you, but you're accursed. 
depart from me from eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It's not for us, it's for them. Depart from me, you that are accursed. Nowhere in scripture is God responsible for the torment in your life. Nowhere in this world that when people say, God did this to me, is that evident in scripture. This battle, this great controversy that we live in is because of sin and this evil devil who wants nothing more than to torment you and point you to God and say, he did it. He did it. Mark chapter 5 Verse three to five continues and it says this, these are the results of having the devil as, as it was this man at least who was possessed by him. In Mark, Mark chapter five, verse three, it says this. It says, he lived among the tombs and no one could restrain him anymore, even with chains. He had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke to pieces and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day amongst the tombs and on the mountains, he was howling and bruising himself. This man was going mad. You know, you don't have to be shackled with chains, screaming on a mountain in a graveyard to know that there's something wrong in your life. I want to share some good news with you though. Isaiah chapter 54, 17 says this. No weapon, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the inheritance the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me. And in case you don't know who it's from, says the Lord. When you align yourself with God, when you are under his protection, Isaiah has said it from the word of God, no weapon, no curse, no evil formed against you shall prosper because my inheritance is now given to you. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. This is important. Talked about legal rights. We talked about these other aspects. I wanna introduce you to something you may not have heard. The thing, the spiritual aspect of strongholds. You guys heard of strongholds? Strongholds. So let's turn to second Corinthians Chapter 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says this. Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they are divine power to destroy strongholds. There are strongholds in this world. There are strongholds in our lives. There are strongholds in the land. Romans in of itself says the earth groans. This earth itself, the great controversy, this earth, because of our sin, because of our decisions, in so many ways, this earth is cursed. And the devil, for a time, owned it. We're going to get into that for a second. But the earth itself groans. Romans chapter 5 even talks about Jesus buying it back the new Adam for each and one of us. I'm gonna just read these quickly instead of turning to the passage, but 2 Corinthians 10 verse six talk about how we could overcome these strongholds, how we could overcome these spiritual battles. And the first thing it talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse six says obedience to Jesus, simple. And next is 2 Corinthians chapter two verse 11, it says, we are able to overcome the enemy. We are able to outwit Satan with the wisdom of God. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse 14 says, soften your hearts to God. Soften your hearts to God. 
I'm going to read this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. In their case, the God of this world, who we know who that is, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers, and I would dare say even to believers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. God has blinded us to this notion that we have legal rights. Spiritually, we have rights in Jesus' name. We have protection in Jesus' name, and we have to claim them. We have to claim them, and we have to step out in faith and claim them and live them and witness to others about them. There's strongholds in this world. I want to share a couple of examples of that, some stories, but I want to finish talking about the next one. What are some things that we are blinded to? Have any of you heard about familiar spirits in Scripture? Familiar spirits. It's another way of saying familial spirits. I'm going to go through a, a quick um, overview of uh, parts of Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 19, verse 2 to 3, it says this. I'm going to talk a little bit about brief, super brief history of, of, of Israel and the involvement of these familial spirits. Isaiah chapter 19, 2 to 3 says this. I will stir up the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they will fight one against the other, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. The spirit of the Egyptians within them will be emptied out, and I will confound their plans. They will consult their idols and the spirits of the dead and the ghosts of their familiar, familiar spirits. You see, any group that doesn't align themselves with God and is under the reign of God and has their own God, they form their own group, their own tribe. They have their own God, their own idols, their own spirits. And we all know that those are just demons. But especially during the Old Testament, you see these other regions, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Philistines, all these different gods they worship, they align themselves with. And when God came and he allowed them to take over and get the land back, they removed these spirits as well. Let's look at a little history. Obviously, we know after Adam and Eve sinned, the ground was cursed. They had to leave. There was death. Ellen White talks about this powerful thing that when they saw the first petal on the rose fall, they wept because they saw death for the first time. Then obviously, there's after the flood, Noah's son. I want to read this. Noah's son, Ham. Genesis 9, 21 to 23 talks about Ham and his brothers. His father got drunk. He was hidden inside. And Ham saw his father's nakedness. And instead of feeling embarrassed or trying to cover him up, he went to make sport of it, tell his other brothers and say, hey, dad's over there wasted and he's drunk. Let's go make fun of This is funny. And the brothers, instead of joining their brother and mocking him, they put their backs to him, grab a cloak, and cover him. And when Noah comes to himself, listen to what he says. Genesis 9, 25 says this, Cursed be Canaan. Canaan are his children. Cursed be your children. Lowest of slaves shall be to his brothers. If you look at that in verse 15 to 18, it says this, Ham's descendants are Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Canaan became the father of Sidon, the firstborn, the Heath, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, all these things. And if you go down now to Genesis, we're going deep, guys. Follow me. We're going deep. Genesis chapter 15. God's talking to Abraham. And he says this to him. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. He says this. The Lord your God said to Abram, know this, Abraham, for certain that your offspring shall be aliens in the land that is not theirs. They shall be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for 400 years. God prophesied to Abraham, your people will be in slavery. Why? Verse 16 tells us why. And they shall come back in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The Amorites were killing their own children. They were burning them, passing them through the fire. They would not care how they treated. They wanted to have prosperity. They wanted to have whatever they want, whatever came to mind. They aligned themselves to their own gods, to their own beliefs. And God's like, in order to protect my people, I'm going to keep them over here until this is done. 
And then when he brought them out, where did he take them to? The land of Canaan. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 says this. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. You look at Exodus chapter 20, it says this very thing too. It says to the third and fourth generation. Exodus 34 also says when it talks about the Lord, the Lord, the merciful talks about his graciousness, his everlastingness, his steadfastness. After that, it talks about to the third and fourth generation. This isn't just these things that we experience here. In fact, there's also things in our lives. Have you noticed that we act like our parents? There's, there's, there's things that you do that mimic generations before. There is issues of anger. There is issues of alcoholism. There is issues of abuse. There are issues that follow us from generation to generation. And it's true. This is a spiritual thing, but it has tangible, physical real, unpleasant results. Matthew 12, verse 43 to 45 says this. When the unclean spirit had gone out of a person, it wanders through the waterless region looking for a resting place, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and live there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So it will also be with the evil generation. Jesus is saying, when you align yourself with him, it's not a one-time event. You choose every day your decision to follow him. And it's not something where, well, I'm blessed this day, and then the next day I'm going to get a curse, and then the next day I'm blessed, next day I'm going to get a curse. No, 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 no. When you align yourself with God, there is tangible blessings in your life, in your family. I want to share some stories now. My wife was born and raised in India. And the region from where she grew up in was a dominantly Hindu region. It was in the region called Prakasaparam. And in this region, there is a very strong Hindu influence. Well, where her parents grew up, in a different region, that was the first place where Adventism and the gospel, Christianity in general, came. That region is so blessed. It has been in newspapers. It has been in areas. They have been blessed financially. They have been blessed familially. They have been blessed in so many places that in that whole region, most of those people end up coming to America, getting education, becoming successful, and moving back. And that place is beautiful. It's a beautiful place. It's your tangible benefits of the gospel. Now, I'm not saying money is a sign of wealth, but I'm saying that God finds ways to bless his people to be a witness. But then where she grew up, where her parents moved, because my wife's father is a pastor, ended up dealing with a lot of these spiritual issues, so much so that they told them what happened and they shared it with me. Many generations in the past there was the great-grandmother who wanted the neighbor's wife for her son. Their only child. And they took her from 
the neighbor's house, brought that daughter into their house and saying, you're going to be married to my son. And that family stood out on the gates on this dirt road, picking up dry dirt and throwing it at the house and blurting curses at them. Curse you for taking my only daughter. May curses fall on your family and your generations and your generations until this day, five generations later. We see at least in one of the children in their marriage, not only divorce, but physical abuse in every single line. So much so that my wife's own brother experienced the same thing. And he had to get out of it. And when they shared this to me, it freaked me out. It freaked me out because I'm like, my mother ended up telling me the same thing. They have this prayer in their family from Psalm 103, one through three. It's a promise. I'm not gonna say it in the language. It might, freak, it might freak you out. You might think I'm doing a curse. I'm not, it's a blessing. But it's Psalm 103, one through three. And it's bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And do not forget all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. We stand in a circle and we pray. We pray for our house. We pray in each room. We pray over our children. We pray over our community. We pray over our neighbors. We put stakes with scripture. We put them around our house. God, this is your house. Because I tell you, when I lived in Victorville, two churches back, I moved into a house, a beautiful house. And the neighbors were looking out their window, who's this person moving in this house? We didn't know what was going on until we finally moved in and some guys on his bike were riding by and he's like, you're gonna be moving in this house, huh? And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, the owner kicked the previous people out of this house because they turned this into a prostitution house. The guy here was a pimp. He had men and women constantly coming in and out, and there were screams throughout the night constantly until we had to call the police over and over and over again. Who are you? And I'm like, I'm a pastor. And they're like, thank God. And I met all the neighbors and talked to all the neighbors and the lady across the street, such a sweet lady, this older Hispanic lady, so sweet, shared with me, we've been praying for that house. We've been praying for that house. And when that happened, I called my Sylvia's dad, my father-in-law, I'm like, I need you to come and bless this house. I need you to cast out whatever thing is in here. I, I need you to bless this house because we want this house to be yours. We want this house to be God's. And when we purchased our first house, I had multiple pastors come in that house, pray over each room, pray over each hall. We put scripture, we put this very prayer on the wall. And we ask God, this is your house. Let no evil enter this house, this family, these children, because this has happened for generations. God, we want to put a stop to it. We want to put a stop to it right now, right now. I went to Laguna Niguel. And our pastor talks about this often, these spiritual strongholds, these legal rights that we have. And multiple times we have gone to multiple members' house. Three members, I'll share just one because of time. There was a family. They moved into the area. This woman was back from the Philippines 
and she encountered a similar situation where there was curses put on her family, and this has been happening for generations, and they moved to this house in Laguna, and they said, there's something in this house. There's something wrong. We don't know what it is. Everyone thinks we're crazy. Every pastor we go to, they say we're delusional. Every place we go to, they say this isn't real. It's all in your head, but we know that you guys believe in this, and I'm like, yeah, I do. I've experienced this thing. This is crazy. We fasted, we prayed, we took some of our elders, we go, and we start hearing the stories of these children who are in the house. For some reason, the child, the son, is constantly being attacked. He hears sounds of the night. He sees handprints on his glass in his bedroom. He sees things moving a lot. He hears creaking, he hears voices. Things are moved. There's very cold places in the house. By the way, in my Victorville house, when we were living there, there were multiple cold places in the house. There are things we ask them to get rid of. There are things we ask them to pray over. We ask them also to fast and pray. Scripture is evident of that. Jesus tried to cast a spirit out. The disciples tried, and Jesus said some things could only be done with fasting and prayer. This is a very serious thing battle church this is tangible this affects your life your children's life your neighbor's life the people in your church mark chapter 5 verse 15 continues and it says this after jesus cast this spirit, this demon, this legion, after he cast this thing out, it says this, they, the people of the surrounding community, the unbelievers in the area, they came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed, uses that word specifically, embraced, covered, drenched, clothed in his right mind. The very man who had the legion. But now they're afraid. Now they're afraid. You know, there's people in this world who may not believe in God. There's people in this world who may not believe that there's a spiritual world, that there's a devil, that there's all these things. All these things just happen on accident. These things just happen because they're circumstantial. My life, an example, is... Man, either I have nine lives or something else is going on. But these people were not afraid of this man growing and cutting himself. They couldn't shackle him, but they were scared that he was in his right mind because they saw there was a power that changed that. They were afraid of who Jesus was. And they say, you get out. Jesus, leave this place. We don't want you here. But they're okay with the man screaming and howling, beating himself, possessed, can't do anything. But they're okay with that. But when they see the power of God, they are afraid and say, Jesus, you have to leave. You have to leave. This is the world we live in. When the power of God is shown, people, if they're not with it, they don't want it. They say, get it out. Pretend it's not there. But I have encouragement for you today, church. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, for our sake, he made to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, in this spiritual battle, in these lines that have been drawn, in these battle lines that we live in, that many people ignore, Jesus himself broke through those barriers. Jesus broke through those barriers in perfect heaven, in nothing wrong, no sin, no darkness. He broke through everything to this world. And though he was not sin, he took it on. He took it on. 
for you and for me so that you wouldn't have to deal with it. But we have to know about this battle, church. We have to know that it's real. We have to know that it exists. We have to know that it affects us in a tangible and real way. And God says, I don't want you to worry about it. I'll take care of it. But you need to know that there are lines that are drawn and I'm the only one who can do it. And people don't like that. And they say, Jesus, you gotta go. An example of this story, to get a big picture of it, Jesus was on the other side of the lake in a nicer area, kind of better to do. And he crossed that sea. He crossed a storm. If you read Mark chapter four, there was a storm. He crossed that storm. And he came to the other side for this one man, Legion, for this one man. And then they told him to go. And Jesus said, you, Legion, stay here. And you go tell people what I've done. You go tell people what you've experienced. You go tell people what you were and now what you are. And Jesus says, I'm going. And he went back. Brothers and sisters, God has come. And he wants to heal us. He wants to fix the brokenness. He wants to fix the family issues. He wants to fix the curses. He wants to move around it because no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Your inheritance is from the God Almighty, the one most high. And he gives that to you. But just because he's gone now doesn't mean he's not coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. 2 Timothy 1.8 tells us, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and what this man needed, a sound mind. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, come now, let us reason together. You and me, let's talk this out because this is real. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become as wool. And the devil still tries to fight. The devil tries to fight. When Jesus was being tempted, what did the devil use? He had to use God's word because he had nothing else. He's like, according to your word, according to your contract, according to the way you work, you got to do this. And Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh, but the word says this. And at the very end, the third temptation, the devil's like, look, I know what you want. You want this world, and I'll give it to you. Why could he say I could give it to you? Because it was his. This world was his. And the devil's like, I'll give it to you. And God's like, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to go through it because I love these guys. I love my creation. And God's not going to bend for the devil. You worship one God and only him you will serve. And the devil fled. Jude chapter 1 verse 9 Even Moses, the devil came to, when God came to take Moses, like, hey, Moses, you're going to heaven. The devil was there too. Jude chapter one, verse nine. But when when, when the archangel Michael contended with the devil and disputed about the body of Moses, he did not dare to bring a condemnation of slander against him. But he said, thank, he said, the Lord rebuke you. He's like, no, man, get out of here. This body's mine. He messed up. He struck the rock. He's mine. He broke your command. And God's like, no, he is mine. He gave himself to me. You can't have his body. He's mine. And he pushed him aside and he took Moses to heaven. The devil knows his power. He knows his rights. You need to know yours. There's a great controversy, church. God's coming. 
It's going to cleanse this world. It's going to cleanse this temple. It's going to make it new. It's going to rid the evil, the injustice, the brokenness. The real brokenness that we all experience. Or do you not know that your body is a temple? Is a temple. This man, Legion, might have given himself to the enemy. He might have been suffering from circumstances. We don't know. All we know is that he's an unbeliever. But he asked God and he came to him. And Jesus cast it out. He cleansed his temple, put him in his right mind. You have been bought with the highest price of the blood of Jesus. The highest price. You couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But he gives it to you. Church, today, God is calling you to make a change. I invite you now to have a prayer with your maker before we close with prayer now. Take a moment right now and say that prayer to God. God, there is a battle. But the beautiful thing is, you've already won. God, I pray that we have been encouraged that when we align ourselves with you, there is no weapon formed against us that shall prosper. You say, come, my child. Let us reason together. Though your sins are dark and crimson and scarlet, they shall be as wool and white as snow. God, may you open our eyes, put us in our right mind, Give us the faith and the power and the love, this faith, hope, love project, Lord, to be the witness wherever we go. In Jesus' name, and God's people said,